In the first millennium BCE, the Phoenicians set up trading outposts along the Iberian coastline, contributing to what's known as the Orientalizing Period. This was a time when art and culture from the Eastern Mediterranean and the Near East spread to the Western Mediterranean via Greek and Phoenician colonization. It had a particularly strong influence on the Etruscans and the Romans. Up until recently, it was thought that the Phoenicians had little impact on the interior of the Iberian Peninsula, though, with much of their culture and art isolated to their coastal settlements. However, a new study published in the journal Antiquity has found evidence during recent excavations for Phoenician cultural influence at an Iron Age village in central Iberia. The paper outlines the archaeological excavations at this site, as well as discussing the mechanisms by which such transcultural processes may have taken place. Let's get into it. The Phoenicians first settled on the coast of the Iberian Peninsula in the 9th century BCE by founding trading outposts and emporia. Researchers have concentrated on how the Phoenicians interacted with indigenous populations in three geographic locations. Firstly, on the coast where these outposts were located. Secondly, in the contact areas buffering the coast. And thirdly, in the interior at a long distance from the trading settlements. The Tartesians are a good example of an indigenous population living close to the Phoenicians who were heavily influenced by them. This map shows the Phoenician outposts, the area occupied by the Tartesians, and the Iron Age archaeological site in the interior called Thero de San Vicente, which is the focus of the most recent study on these interactions. It's long been thought that cultural influence was mostly driven by the indigenous male elites adopting foreign customs, and that this was more common in the case of geographical proximity. However, the latest study shows that the acculturation process was more nuanced and complex than that, and was probably driven by female mobility after marriage. During the Iron Age, the Iberian Central Plateau was inhabited by small peasant villages, which left behind virtually no evidence for burial customs. They traded in raw materials, mostly metals, and deposited hordes of bronze objects, a tradition that would have been established hundreds of years before. Most of the evidence they left behind is to be found in their domestic settlements. The recent study looks at the Iron Age site of Thero de San Vicente from 600 BCE onwards. It's located in an area of the central plateau with abundant metallic ores. Access was via the Tormes River and a prehistoric track that in later times became known as Via de la Plata. Terra de San Vicente was built as a hilltop village surrounded by a wall and populated with somewhere between 250 and 300 people. Its houses were made of mud brick and consisted of circular layouts with a bench around the interior wall and a rectangular central hearth. Each house was accessed via a porch. Since the roundhouses were fairly small, it's likely each was inhabited by a nuclear family. Even though the houses were emptied before being abandoned, archaeologists have found plenty of material dating to that time period from storage spaces and middens in between the dwellings. It's these finds that are helping experts reach conclusions about the society and culture of this Iron Age community. The houses were organised into neighbourhoods, but overall, the distribution of dwellings throughout the excavated area of the site suggests an informal layout. In the study, the researchers concentrated on the neighbourhood around the dwelling labelled House 1 to draw conclusions about the acculturation of the people that lived at Thera de San Vicente. They looked at the diversity of the material culture, the type of architecture, the number of properties, how long each dwelling was inhabited, evidence for specialised crafts and pottery ratios. House 1 and four other roundhouses were found to cluster around and face onto an open courtyard alongside 13 other subsidiary structures and several silos. Instead of the usual single bench, House 1 had two benches, which would have been able to seat 20 people. It also had a central fireplace that was different to the other dwellings and an oxhide layout, 
which is reminiscent of Tartesian sites. Evidence for the long-term use of this house was found in the constant replastering of its walls and refurbishing of its floors. At the time of abandonment, it was purposefully set on fire and then filled in. Several dating methods put this abandonment somewhere between the years 650 and 575 BCE. The group of houses was probably inhabited by an extended family group. Fragments of 15 querns were excavated from house one, an unusually high number for a single household. There were also two vessels with ceramic handles which had been used as lamps, a distinctly Eastern Mediterranean practice. Artificial lighting such as this wasn't found in the interior of the Iberian Peninsula at the time. Pottery sheds uncovered from the middens represented around 100 painted bowls that would have been used for individual food consumption, as well as vessels used for storage and cooking. Other distinctly Eastern Mediterranean finds uncovered from House One include eight faience beads, a sherd from an ancient Egyptian faience bowl, a faience amulet depicting the Egyptian goddess Hathor, Phoenician red slip vessels, and two terracotta animal protomes. Specialised craft tools were excavated, such as bone spindle whorls, which would have been used to spin fine threads. These were in addition to standard heavy ones made of clay, which made thicker yarn. Tools were also found for painting fineware ceramics, and a pottery shed was discovered which had been reused as a palette for pigments. Red ochre stains were also present. In the study, the researchers carried out macroscopic analyses of the pottery vessels with oriental features to see what production techniques had been used. Six sherds were investigated in total. Sherd 1 came from a lamp, Sherd 2 came from a burnished dish, and Sherds 3, 4, 5, and 6 came from tableware. The analyses showed that these ceramics had all been produced locally, but included orientalizing forms, techniques, or motifs. Evidence for techniques used in more distant regions of the Iberian Peninsula was also found. The authors of the paper explore how this transculturation probably came about, looking at gendered mobility based on the evidence gleaned from household archaeology. Much research has been done on these movements in prehistoric Europe, mostly based on evidence from burials. However, little has been done on the Iberian Peninsula, and since burials from that period are scarce, a site such as Thero de San Vicente offers another avenue for exploring this topic. The researchers suggest that House One was a meeting place for the families who inhabited the other dwellings surrounding the courtyard. This is based on the two benches, the larger than usual fireplace, the huge number of querns, and the fragments of banqueting pottery. If you remember, I mentioned that sherds related to 100 bowls were found, so this indicates a place where feasting took place. House One was probably the home of the couple that founded the family, a patriarch and his wife. A rectangular structure labelled as Building 3 and split into three parts was found upon excavation to have a striking resemblance to a Phoenician temple. Since nearby middens contained terracotta objects that may have been votive offerings, the author suggests that Building 3 was a cultic site for the ritual practices of the neighbourhood. Nothing similar has been found in central Iberia, but it is comparable with the site of Oropos in Greece. It's plausible that this neighbourhood practised patrilocal residence, where married sons lived with their families, but married daughters left to join other neighbourhoods belonging to their husbands' families when they got married. Overall, Thero de San Vidente doesn't appear to have much of a hierarchical social structure. The researchers suggest that the cultural hybridity present at the site was probably the result of post marital mobility of women from other regions. Craft specialisation was often practised by high-ranking Iron Age women. This, together with other studies that show how such women tended to be more mobile, indicates that the hilltop village of Thero de San Vidente may have imported many of its ideas as a result of marriage, which also shows wives were not passive, but played an important role in contributing to their new family. That's it, what do you think? Cultural hybridity isn't unusual in the ancient world. The idea that vast geographic distances would reduce such cultural exchanges in Iron Age Iberia seems rather strange to me, considering how many videos I've done discussing evidence 
for long distance trade in the earlier Bronze Age. Europe, North Africa and the Near East were pretty well connected for the time. In this image from the paper, the authors summarise the links between the archaeological record and what that implies for the social structure and transcultural practices of the community. It's interesting that women were probably the driving force behind cultural exchange due to marriage and mobility. That's logical, and it's not just about pretty ceramic vessels or finer threads. Artificial lighting was very unusual in the interior at that time, but obviously immensely practical. So it's fun to imagine a new wife rocking up to the village and showing off her fancy technology. The Iron Age was certainly an interesting time in the Mediterranean. Remember that we still don't know a lot about the Tartesians, and although the Phoenicians left a lot of material culture behind and played a hugely important role in the diffusion of the first alphabet, there's still a lot of mystery surrounding them. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to hit the like button if you haven't already. The algorithm gods are a temperamental bunch. Thank you to my patrons and channel members, and I'll catch up with you next time.